All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. Well, we got a show going on now. I got my man, Mr. Brandon Cooper, on the line here. What's up, Brandon? Tell everybody where you're from, what do you do? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, from Detroit, Michigan, originally. I uh, currently re reside in uh, Los Angeles, California. I went to Michigan State University. Um, school wasn't really for me, so I left Michigan State and uh, pursued business opportunities, things that got me into uh, general entrepreneurship. And uh, long story short, I've always had a passion for creating things and disrupting industries, so here I am. Creating things and disrupting industries, man. You know, and that's exactly why I wanted to bring you on the, the show, Brandon, because I like... The whole point of this real talk is to have real conversations with real movers in the industry that are making movements now and in the future that are really out there to inspire others and to bring some content that's valuable to the marketplace, to people, and just really to get people's brains thinking. You know, everybody loves to read, get knowledge. So I want to provide that and I, your opinion is super valuable especially in the in the crypto world tech business yeah. you know so yeah. guys so he's a ceo of a company called afid and you guys have robots right and tell us a little bit more about how your company is changing the space in the nine to five and how you're automating the workspace environment yeah I was working at a big tech company and uh, they were really just working me like a dog. And I was sitting there at my desk, like a lot of people around the world, millions of people around the world said, man, I wish I didn't have to work so hard. We spend so much time at our jobs that uh, we get duped out of time with our family and friends, uh, things that are most important, uh, which allowed me to uh, create AFIT where we're, disrupting the nine to five by allowing digital robots to work for us like employees. Um, if you could have tried to imagine a world where uh, you're doing the same task, but <clears throat> you've programmed it basically into a digital version of yourself as an employee and you set your digital twins out onto the internet to do various tasks that you choose for them to do. And when they, when they do certain tasks, when they do the labor or if they make sales on websites, uh, you get paid from that activity. <clears throat> so our goal is to create the automation engine uh, for people to go into our ecosystem, find the tasks that are already uh, programmed by developers. So you don't have to know how to code. You just choose the different tasks you want your bots to do. And you basically give the developer a small fee every time uh, that particular task is run in the ecosystem. Uh, it takes everything from the traditional legacy system that we're used to right now to, uh, as I say, horse, from horse and buggy to the electric car overnight. And what that means is you, right now you trade time for money. You have to be there. If you get sick, you can't go on to work. Uh, right. If you're sick too long, then you'll get fired. And... Um, you know, with the digital version, it's better because robots don't get sick. Robots don't call off. And uh, everyone is afraid that robots are going to take our jobs. But in order for us to uh, have more time with our family and friends, uh, robots should take our jobs. We should just get paid for it. Mm. So what I hear you saying is essentially like digital leverage. You're basically hiring out this task that is repetitive that's time consuming right. and what is it learned by an algorithm that you code into it mm -hmm. and it does it learn as it works or do you have to kind of tweak it here and there to make the right decisions for you yeah uh, so basically if if you're a non-developer you would just go into a marketplace and choose the tasks that are already pre-coded a developer may choose to create an automated trading bot for you and if you like that particular bot, you base, you just install that to your bot. If you can think of it similar to the Matrix where uh, Neo didn't know the fighting style, right? 
and then he downloaded it and he knew how to fight. It's the exact same way. Mm, right. That makes sense. So how, how does it play into the crypto space and Bitcoin? Is it tied directly yeah. like with the, with the blockchain and, and how is it integrated? Yeah, it's a hybrid based system. You as what we call a controller, you're, you're, a ba you're basically a bot controller in essence. Uh, so your clones of yourself are powered by the Abion token. The Abion token works as a conductor to power out particular tasks. Very similar to Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, when you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you get the tokens. The more tokens you have, the more games you can play. In the AFID ecosystem, the more Abion tokens you have, the more robot power you have. And the developers would, would in essence, on a granular level, they're called API calls. It'll say, uh, I want to do this automated task. So for that automated task, Brandon, I just want a small piece of your Abion to power this particular task. Mm. So the more tokens you have, the more power you're going to have, and the more leverage you're going to be able to put onto certain tasks, right? Correct. That makes sense. That's correct. So on your, because you have a platform and a website, and now you're developing an app to go onto your phone, right? Correct. So how does it, you know, that the phone app, where is that playing? Uh, can you, con you're controlling a, a software through the phone or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mobile application is more so on the go, or you can try to imagine, uh, watching a football game. Like last night, Monday night football game on, imagine you're sitting there and then your phone is dinging off. And every time your phone is dinging off, that's telling you that your clone just made you some money because it worked a particular task and it got a sale. We as AFIT are creating the first use case uh, to introduce this to the general public with e-commerce. Everyone has seen a chat bot on a website. They're virtual assistants. They right. sit at the bottom of the site and they say, hey, welcome to the website. My name is Brandon. Uh, how can I help you? It's, it's uh, exactly the same as going into a mall. When a, a person walks into a mall and there's a sales rep on the floor, that sales rep will say, what can I help you with in Best Buy? What can I help you with at Target? And then they can tell you what aisle to go to. So virtual assistant is doing the exact same thing. Uh, what we noticed was this particular vertical of, of chatbots have always been used for businesses and it's growing where uh, every website eventually is gonna have to have one because you're gonna need 24 seven support. You can lose a customer if they get confused or they don't know if they can't find what they're looking for they can just leave. Uh, but if you can capture that particular customer and grab them, um, you know, with a virtual assistant that runs 24 seven while you're asleep, you can capture that customer or potentially get a sale. Right. The beauty about AFIT is, is a lot of people may be listening and saying, well, yeah, isn't that taking our jobs? What, what, what we're doing is we're saying, yeah, you can use this chat bot, but we're going to have the human shadow it. So you at home, We'll have the AFIT mobile application. You can sit behind that bot once it's summoned out to a website for a potential sale. And as time goes on, you won't really even need to do much human input because the bot is going to learn over time using machine learning. But what this does for you, it allows you to be ubiquitous. It allows you to be omnipresent where 30 versions of yourself are working on the internet at one time. And if wow. you're lucky enough to sell an iPad or a refrigerator on one of those websites in our network, you get paid for it. Wow, so you can really, as a business owner, like I can see this in real estate, say you, you, like you're running some, some ads in different locations and someone opts in, it can pretty much take it to set an appointment at, like say as a, a virtual assistant would they can pre-qualify a prospect they can see what their motivation is because you is that pretty much what you can program as essentially a virtual assistant that's automated yeah we set the base layer we set the layer one for the particular bot uh, on that website you as the human controller shadowing it are just adding your input as a subject matter expertise uh, person and you can help that customer along the way with thing, your opinion to say 
well, I believe the black shoes look better. I believe the pink ones look better if they ask for your opinion. Uh, or if you're a sneakerhead and you say, uh, yeah, you don't really want to wear these over these because of this reason, as if you would in a store. And it, this turns the gig economy, um, it makes the gig economy 100 times better than what's out there. Because if you go DoorDash, you get in a car and you grab the food, you have to spend an hour in traffic like you do here in L.A., and then you drop the food off. I mean, you just spend an hour of your time. But uh, this allows the digital version of this to happen where um, you're, in essence, delivering food to 30, 40, 50 places at once. Wow. That's 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 like revolutionary. Um, can Thanks. you take this program and say teach it how to make tr day trades for you and look for specific trends and charts and dollars and even making bets for you on games on uh, on live sports games certainly so, uh, sports betting is in the pipeline uh, automated trading will be one of the um, first verticals that will be available in the marketplace once it opens so after this e-commerce we're going to launch with the e-commerce use case and then we're going to open it up for the developer community with the marketplace and let people build whatever they want for the, the ecosystem. So nine coding people like my mom can go in and, in essence, license out the plugin she likes, the horses that she wants to bet on, per se. Mm, and you'll teach it. So you can take what it sounds like. You're just you're making the playing field and you're opening the doors and whatever people want to do, they can just kind of build it to what their specific scenario is. Correct. Whether you're in art, whether you're in music, or if you want to use a artificial intelligence based content writer where you just input certain keywords and it can write an article for you automatically. Those things are other use case examples. Oh, wow. So how how can it help like music producers and, you know, live artists like just putting lyrics together or mastering and doing things that would otherwise take hours, or even with photography or video editing, it could probably do that since it's AI, right? Yeah, it really depends on what it is you're looking for as a photographer or for video editing, um, which would probably be lighting or machine learning suggestions on uh, different transitions that may not look right, help assist you along the way would probably be an example. But for music, it's really easy. You could use a, a DJ plug-in that uses artificial intelligence. It can go off crowd noise and it can uh, adjust to the crowd and see how they're going and it'll start to transition into a new song. And then the real DJ just sits back and he supervises that particular, um, that particular plug-in, right? It's a lot of, a lot of it's, it's up to the imagination of the developer community of, of what they want to do, right? And we as AFIT will do our best to let the community create the things that they want to create and not uh, they don't really want to spew on the big companies. But as we know, they undercut their own developers. They create things that these developers have spent thousands, maybe even millions of dollars on to, to get to market. And then uh, here comes Apple or Google at a or Facebook at a particular conference and they announce a feature and then they've put their own developer community out of business. So we want to steer clear of that as much as we possibly can. Unless the community is asking us to build it ourselves, then we'll consider it. Right. Yeah, definitely. Really automate. You can automate a DJ based on the feedback. That's, yeah. that's crazy. This is so deep and you know, the average person doesn't really understand it. You know, I mean, what was it that you saw in the marketplace, the need that inspired you to, you know, make this a reality? What, what was it that was the tipping point or, you know, that popped the bubble? Ideation was the job, the, the workforce economy of where it currently is, seeing a lot of my peers working very hard and not really having much time with their family. And then uh, on, on the developer piece or the imagination piece, I really just try to go into the future and uh, sometimes it can go over your head, but I can really see into the future very, very well. It's just one of my gifts. And I've been blessed to have that and to have an awesome team as well. 
Uh, but yeah, that's what that was. That's what inspired it is disrupting the nine to five. I've, I've always been passionate about it for the last, I would say, good 20 years uh, looking for a solution subconsciously, but never really tried to act on it and mm-hmm. figure out how do we solve this particular problem? And we figured it out. Wow. So we saw that our loved ones, even ourselves, we're spending 80% of our working, you know, in an office or a cubicle. And if there's a way we can buy our time back by using this technology is essentially what we're doing. Right. Yeah. It's really key. I mean, it it can, it can affect marriages. Um, You know, you hear the term work wife and all this type of stuff or work husband and uh, not to steer this off topic, but I think it's really important that, um, and people are getting time with their spouse. And then if you have kids, it affects the dynamics of a household. You get home at uh, around 6.37 maybe after traffic, if you're getting off at five, right? And then you help them with homework and you cook dinner, your day is over. And we repeat this stupid cycle yeah. five days a week for uh, 60 years. It just doesn't make any sense. I always use this example if if you walked into a job and they had this titan tron type of thing or this big meter and it showed the amount of hours that you're going to work and it counted downward so let's say you walk into the job they hire you say welcome and then it shows 62,000 hours and it started counting downward and you would look up at that 62,000 hours and you would almost want to walk out the next day yeah. but it's masked. We don't see that. We're not tracking that. We don't look at it that way. But that's what's happening. That's the amount of time you spent away from your loved ones. Mm-hmm. You're sent. I mean, I mean, that's why I got in business because you know, trading your time for money for the dollar, your time is worth more than ever, and the dollar every day is being worth less and less and less, and our incomes they're not going up as much as the inflation, the cost of living. And that's why we see yeah. spouses and kids, everybody having to pitch in. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, we've been indoctrinated in this, this thought process that, Hey, you know, do the, the traditional path, go to college and work for the rest of your yeah. life, retire at 70 years yeah. old. Like why, why wait till 70 years old to enjoy your life? Enjoy it now. Right. Absolutely. And um, we, we can get caught up in these distractions, these grand distractions. Everything is, a, especially here in America, is really just a bunch of busyness, things that know how to pull us in a hundred different directions. And it's really a whole lot of small nothings. It could be, oh, yeah, you have to do this. And the, the system is set up to, for people to fail ultimately in terms of time, right? And uh, we have to get off this hamster wheel. Yeah, I I completely agree. You know, and that that's one of the things. Like, I wanted to start this uh, this this podcast series is to instill these thoughts in people's minds that might not, you know, they, they might be comfortable, but people don't realize the amount of time that there is. Sure, there's, you know, you have a long life, but you don't get any of it back. Yeah, like. Yeah. We need to live life like we're going to be dying. Yeah. Spend it with your family. Spend it with the things that matter. Do things that matter to you and make you, you happy, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the we talk about dying when we're old, but you know, tomorrow isn't promised. Freak accidents can happen. Uh, right. you know, God forbid, right? But uh, tomorrow isn't guaranteed for us. So we, we definitely can't, we have to have that balance to where we're not, for one, we're not working on our dreams as hard as we would on our jobs because you're spending the same amount of time away from family. So it really is just finding that middle ground to where uh, you're able to take a vacation and you're not taking a vacation to escape. You're right. on vacation to be on vacation and you want to have a luxury to say, all right, I'm ready to leave. Let me go not uh, let me go right back into the stress pool. It just doesn't make sense to return to that stress pool. No, it doesn't. 
why we live 90 i mean you know not us but you know maybe a majority of people stuck in that well it came from the industrial revolution right to create the workers to yeah. build it up so we're trying to we're trying to break yeah. that that cycle of making workers and really make people who are going to provide value to the marketplace provide value to other people yeah and that those Just are the people that get rewarded <laughs> Yeah, Henry Ford, man. The assembly line. Right, right. So now we're trying to make business owners and people that are, you know, not everybody should be a business owner, right? But people that are really, you know, the top of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization. You're trying to ascend that from survival to self-actualization. But unfortunately, people get stuck in survival and just shelter, right? And they never escape that 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 poverty cycle yeah yeah and it's conditioning we can recondition the way things should be we can make for a better humanity ultimately but it's going to take the collective uh aphid doesn't become aphid without a community behind us uh aphid doesn't work without supporters without the customers for the businesses it's all uh, the, like the law of oneness where we're all connected in some type of way and uh, it's all about just changing the vibration of what that looks like and we're just implementing that spirit into business right we're not going too high on the spiritual realm of, of things because we are a company and we do operate for profit but a lot of what we're doing is for humanity mm, I love that I mean, Brandon, how, I mean, where do you see, where do you see AFID in, in 10 years from now? I mean, with how fast things are evolving, how yeah. deep, deeply involved into people's everyday life can you, do you expect and do you envision it to, to get to? Yeah, I see AFID as being the go-to or the first company that you think of when you think of automation. If you look at big companies, General Electric or uh, like the Fords and the Apples, and they all have a certain brand identity, uh, AFIT will be known for automation. And being the tech company that did things differently and uh, doing things with the right frame of mind behind it, I don't. I haven't felt a great spark with any company that I've seen in a very, very long time. I love the innovation from Uber, and uh, you know, Lyft is what I would deem to be the Pepsi to Uber's Coke, mm-hmm. and then uh, Airbnb is probably one of the most innovative companies. But the, the other companies, they really just uh, we, we want to be the calling card for the general public to say the underdog and the smaller startups can win in today's society. And it isn't just three or four big companies controlling everything because uh, they're just looking and preying upon smaller companies. And uh, we as a smaller companies have to uh, come together and uh, disrupt. That's right. You know, you, you know, like these big companies making more and more profits, they can take over and dominate. But when you're coming with these ideas that can just, revolutionize there's a need for it right it, it, every single person yeah. in the world essentially can use this and when you have when you have a solution for a billion people i mean we're you you can go you can go anywhere you want for sure and uh, the future we know as you mentioned everything is moving so fast we just saw the the, the metaverse announcement and uh, the things that Tesla is doing with the, like, you know, the, um, all of, or Elon Musk in general. I mean, you look at Starlink, you look at Neuralink, things are moving yeah. uh, extremely fast, as you mentioned. And um, I'm glad to be alive, to be honest with you. Blockchain and cryptocurrency, and we're a part of that paradigm shift in the financial system. And for whatever yeah. reason, money has been late to the game. I'm just glad that we're alive right now to capitalize off it, not only from an innovation standpoint, but uh, from a financial standpoint as well. Yeah. No, I I mean, man, I agree. 
right there you hit it right in the nail paradigm shift we're in a paradigm shift thing yeah. it's already in front of us it's already happened the technology's here it just takes time for people to become familiar i mean just five years ago seeing bitcoin or even cryptocurrency people talking about it they thought it was black magic but now it's on the news you hear your mom talking about dogecoin yeah. you know <laughs> yeah it's it's a crazy time that aaron Rodgers he sent me some bitcoin yesterday i saw um, that he, they gave away they gave away uh like one million dollars or so he's in it tom brady's invested in the ftx him and his wife uh, Matt Damon is crypto.com. UFC has it all over. The advertisements are everywhere. And all these celebrities are jumping on board. Once it becomes, uh, once the celebrities jump in the way that they have, it changes everything for uh, people. Because in America, we're a celebrity driven society. If right. me as the everyday person, if I say something, might get uh, 25 likes or something on it. But, uh, if, if Wiz Khalifa tweets it out, then it's like 2,000 retweets or something like that. So it's just people want to follow what celebrities are doing. And if they're in crypto like they are now, it's only going to get larger. Uh, Burger King just announced they're doing something with Robin Hood now with crypto and rewards. So it's, it's on a roll now, and it's no stopping it. And NFTs had a big part in uh, crypto adoption. So I think I think it's trying to transition now from as I've, I've been saying for last couple of months, crypto is a toddler, uh, but it's almost getting to you know young teens uh, right now in, in terms of uh, market penetration. Yeah, At, w companies getting into it. You see El Salvador trying to adopt Bitcoin. I mean, it there's, there's Twitter, momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's momentum. Yeah, and, and as long as and people shouldn't be afraid of China banning them, I mean, China, they ban Google, YouTube, Facebook, or it doesn't mean anything. Right. I mean, China bans gotta, it, you should probably invest in it. <laughs> yeah. Right. People got to understand, first of all, what China is. Correct. <laughs> you the know, communist and, society. I mean, Jack Ma went missing for how long? We don't know. He's the richest in China. Right. Because that, that showed that he was a he was obviously a threat to their regime and uh yeah. you know when you're providing that kind of service you can go both ways and they saw it as a threat so yeah if they do one thing it's like hey that it's obviously on the radar as a threat so hey maybe it's something worth yeah. looking into yeah. where do you see do you see bitcoin becoming a currency and i know it's not ready yet but what will it take for it to become more fungible as you know the u.s dollar in my opinion, and this isn't financial advice, right. uh, but Bitcoin will be and is a store of value like digital gold. I think because of the popularity, you'll see, because you see NFL players are receiving Bitcoin as uh, for a salary opposed to regular U.S. dollar. And um, companies are going to take upon this sa the same thing with Bitcoin, they're going to grab Bitcoin, they're going to grab Ethereum, and then you might see Litecoin maybe third. But in my opinion, in terms of everyday transactions going to Starbucks or ordering a pizza or even payroll in terms of the fees that are associated with Bitcoin and Ethereum, it doesn't make sense. It isn't scalable. Bitcoin, from a technological standpoint, is AOL, 56K. Uh, believe it or not, youngins listening, we when, when you had to connect to the internet, someone called us, it disconnected us from the internet. And then when we did connect, we would hear the static sound. We have to wait about 30 seconds for it to connect us to the internet. But it was extremely slow. Right. Uh, so that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin sauce isn't speed. Bitcoin is, is not carbon neutral. Um, the, the Bitcoin energy consumption is more powerful than uh, some countries out here in terms of what 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 it's taken up to to move um, transactions, and then it can't hold that many transactions within a block on the blockchain. But if you look at other currencies like uh, Stellar Lumens or 
uh, I believe Stellar Lumens and XRP are the two uh, currencies that are going to be the day-to-day -day transaction uh, uh, cryptocurrencies because of low fees and you can power them out extremely quickly. And that doesn't exclude Solana or any other ones because there's 12,000 cryptocurrencies. So speed is inevitable across the board. But I believe those are the, are the two that are positioned properly. Right. So, I mean, for, you know, every everyday person to understand all these cryptos and all coins coming out, do you feel it's more like kind of like the survival of the fittest? People will start to feel and see what actually works in the real world and it'll come, it'll narrow itself down over time to the ones that have positioned themselves correctly. Yeah. Right now there's one doesn't have to lose for the other one to win. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have to lose in order for Ethereum to win. I believe that's why we have the market cap. That's why we have the spread. Right. So, but an everyday person, um, you know, you can you can have analysis paralysis by right. everything that's coming out and all of the information that's out there. But there are a good twenty currencies or so that are really stable in terms of the ones that have made themselves as pioneers in, in cryptocurrency but uh, ethereum has their work cut out for them with solana and polka dot mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're chasing their heels and ethereum is trying to figure it out you might try to send 80 dollars, and your fee might be uh, more than what you're trying to send and it, it it's it's poorly crafted right in essence uh, the smart contract aspect is amazing but uh, it's only going to take you so long before the Cardanos of the world uh, come take your spot because uh, you weren't able to get with change. Mm -hmm. Where do you see Cardano evolving into in the next couple of years? I like that they took their time. They didn't succumb to the pressure of the community because people are very impatient. And if, you, if you're impatient and you're new in the crypto space, then go have some fun on the lottery ticket coins and some of the meme coins and that don't have any particular use case and i think it's cool if you want to put 200 dollars and whatever into a coin that might make you twenty thousand, forty thousand, or so and you want to invest it in something else then that's perfectly fine you can do both it doesn't have to be one or the other right right um but yeah i, I mean ultimately the ones with the proper use case are the ones that people should prepare themselves for it's a little difficult i always tell people and again this isn't financial advice but uh, once it crosses that dollar threshold it's a lot harder to accumulate wealth on something and it is eventually going to reach the point of no return so I, I think cardano has positioned themselves from a technological standpoint better than any other uh, project that's been out there and um you still hear vaporware stuff and what do they actually have but the alonzo and the, the updates that they've done uh i commend them and, I, and charles hoskins i like his mission I like he likes everything open source and uh, he understands that uh, their protocols of, and their governance everything that they have going on is going to be bigger than him and that's what he has vocally expressed that he wants um so yeah, I'm I'm a supporter of of what Cardano is doing. Yeah, I I agree. And as far as you know, identifying these these coins right, for future speculation, what are the I would say the you know the main three things that a person should look for you know trying to get into the crypto space, you know that's not ready to get into you know a Bitcoin and is ready to yeah. start putting their money in. You know, what are the traits that are common among these coins? Is that like how they're structured where you're like, hey, look, this this is something right here. And the way their position is looking real good for the future. What should it look for? Yeah. First thing is utility. So anytime you hear the word utility or use case, that means how does that project, foundation, company, wherever it may be, how do they intend to use that particular cryptocurrency or digital asset token or whatever it may be uh, that's the first thing so examples as we mentioned bitcoin 
Bitcoin is a store of value. So if you're investing in that, it may be more like digital gold. You're just buying it to hold it, uh, that you believe it's going to be worth something higher in value in the future. And then you have other use cases where it's Ethereum, where it's a smart contract. So think about digital contracts. Uh, maybe one day you want to buy a house and the smart contract can be set up for you to, it can automatically check your credit, wherever it may be. And then it speeds up the, the buying process for you as a person who wants to get a home. And once you buy that home, it's everyone can see that you're the owner of it. That's the beauty of blockchain for the newbies listening. It's on a public ledger. It doesn't say Brandon Cooper on it, but it has a, the tracking number. And if you hold that particular tracking number to your particular wallet, you're the owner of it. So NFTs are a great example for that. And then uh, succinctly, then you have XRP, which is working with, uh, Ripple, the company, is using XRP to work as a bridge asset in between banks. Right now, to send money from bank A to bank B, it takes them three to five days for them to get the money through their Nostro Vostro accounts, uh, which are basically liquidity pools for the banks to interact. So it's actually quicker for you to fly somewhere and deliver cash than it is to send it um, through uh, through the electronic messaging system like SWIFT, which is the, the pre-existing legacy system. So they're allowing you to liquidate that money between three to five seconds. Um, wow. And they don't have to wait on that money. So we're talking trillions of dollars in volume uh, that's going to happen in the financial system. Uh, and then lastly is uh, how uh, AFID is using the Abion token in the, the uh, ecosystem where uh, the more tokens you have, the more uh, bot clones that you can power out in the ecosystem to go work tasks for you on your behalf. So the the Abion's use case is saving you time without having to sacrifice losing money for it. So that's an example of use case. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, once you narrow down the use case part of it, you want to look at the supply, uh, how scarce is it, and uh, SHIB that you may see has an enormous supply. Uh, but the hype has uh, allowed people to shrink it down because people are buying it up so quickly. And it isn't even listed on Robinhood yet. Uh, so that kind of negates what I'm saying in terms of the supply. If you see huge popularity on it like that, just be careful because you don't want to pump and dump where you get in because everyone's hype about it. But it doesn't have a use case. It can fall right to the floor. We right. just saw it with the Squid Game uh, token or it just happened. So be careful on those. That's why if, if you're investing into ones with use cases and they're how they really want to use it, it's a safer bet. VeChain is using it for supply chain. Uh, you know, we, we go up to particular groceries and it says organic on it. How do we know it's organic? We're ignorantly just reading text right. on a tomato and saying it's organic. But if we could scan something and see it on the chain on the public ledger of who the farmer was and uh, at what time did it change temperatures? And uh, you know, all of these things can be tracked along the way with blockchain. Uh, so that would be my particular suggestions to newbies entering a space of what to look for. And if you're a person who uh, wants, if you're a reader, they have what's called white papers where it talks about the project. They have the paragraphs on it and how they want to use it. Most of them are very technical. So you, you may want to watch some of the, the, the team talk about their projects on YouTube will help you get a better understanding if you're not a technical person, but the white papers are available to you for the most part for most uh, legitimate projects. Hmm. So you want to definitely do your research, understand it, especially coming from the team, instead of hearing some other person's interpretation of what they think it is, right? So go to the source. Absolutely then, go yeah. to the source. You have to go to the source. And some of these altcoins and, and meme coins, we don't know the source. We don't know where, you know, it, it, how they're you, created out of the blue, right? <laughs> they're, they're created out of the blue. And uh, yeah, the team is important. You, you do want the, the, the team that's behind particular projects to, to be legitimate. And you can cross reference on LinkedIn or wherever it may be, opposed to someone that can just vanish on you out of the blue. But hey, look at Bitcoin. No one knows 
who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And uh, you, you can see Bitcoin has gone from where it started in 2009 to now 60,000 something a coin. Right. So it could be, as you said, the utility, the supply. If you don't know where it came from, we don't know where it came from. We don't know who. So it could be irrelevant, but it could play a factor into how it affects your decision making. So yeah, for sure. supply, just like sure. this, like the U.S. dollar, what we're seeing right now, how much money supply the Fed has printed in the past year is almost was it they've increased about 30 percent of the total money supply. Yeah, and they just run into the ground and fiat is it's burning, man. It, it's burning. It's been burning a long time ago. My mom and them were, when they were younger, um, a dollar <laughs> probably get you 20 Snickers and uh, juice and everything. And now it can't even get you a loaf of bread. And that just goes to show you. I mean, look at gas. I mean, here in Los Angeles, it's ridiculous in price. They're just, in essence, pushing people over to electric cars. So you're going to see Tesla. And Neo, and they have um, the the car company Lucid now. The electric cars are uh, high gas prices is great for electric car companies. So you can expect to see some stock market movement on this. And uh, I'm I'm interested in seeing what's what's happening with this here. I've been considering it myself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, man, <laughs> this I mean, is crazy. How much I drive is in real estate. These five dollars, oh, five dollars yeah. a gallon is. You know, some it's getting to the point oh, where they're they're forcing this revolution. What they're doing, they're forcing it. You know, it's our divine order. Yeah. No matter how much we try to do things, and we have the illusion of free choice, but uh, where the we're just the Sims. To me, I think if whether you believe in God or not, there's some type of collective power that's powering everything, and we're running in simulation. It, it feels like we're running it, but we don't know if we're the, like the Simpsons or yeah. anything else that people are watching. What's the difference? Right. Like even, even our own opinions, where do we, where our opinion is based off someone else's opinion. Like where, where are things, the source, right? Especially with how integrated we are on our cell phones. We're constantly connected. Always. There's some stimulus, you know? So that's why yeah meditation is so crucial you know that you yeah. meditate right yes sir yes sir yeah i look at it as having an antenna we all have this antenna and the higher consciousness is pushing these thoughts into our receiver which is the antenna 